Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Grand Rounds. I have the great honor and pleasure to introduce today's speaker, and I want to tell you a little bit about her. Dr. Cindy H. Liu is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School, the director of the Developmental Risk and Cultural Resilience Program within the departments of Pediatric Newborn Medicine and Psychiatry at Brigham and Women's Hospital. She is also a licensed clinical psychologist. Her research focuses on stress and mental health within the lifespan, including the perinatal period and young adulthood. And she is currently a principal investigator for several pandemic mental health studies, including the COVID-19 Adult Resilience Experiences Study a longitudinal study that seeks to understand the experiences of college students and young adults throughout the pandemic. Her areas of investigation include the measurement and mechanisms of psychosocial stress, cultural differences in socio-emotional development, and developmental and culturally-based interventions that reduce mental health disparities. She received her degree in clinical psychology from the University of Oregon and completed her clinical internship at McLean Hospital and postdoctoral fellowship from Boston Children's Hospital. So she is coming home to us today. Her work has been funded by the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation and featured in various outlets, including the New York Times, USA Today, and CBS News. Her work can be found on www.drcrlab.com, which might be one of the coolest domain names ever. Dr. Liu also, now these are my words, happens to be a really wonderful and inclusive research collaborator and mentor to countless scientist practitioners. If she ever invites you to collaborate on a project, Say yes. Welcome. Welcome, Dr. Liu. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, yes, McLean has a really special place in my heart. I would not be in Boston if it weren't for matching at McLean. Um, I thought it was gonna be a one-year stint back in 2007 when I was an intern. I left my car in California, as well as so many belongings, thinking that I would go back and uh, uh, live, my, uh, live out my life in California. And now it's been year 14 in Boston. Um, and I've just um, been the beneficiary, uh, beneficiary of um, uh, mentorship from uh, Dr. Phil Lewandowski and uh, many others who um, played a pivotal role in my training as a uh, intern. Um, so with that, I'm going to share a bit about my work on young adults during the pandemic. And let me go ahead and share my screen. And many of you are intimately familiar, familiar with and have substantial expertise in young adult mental health. Um, you know, this is a period of time that is so crucial when it comes to understanding the emergence of mental health concerns. And we are now in a pandemic. We are still in a pandemic. And of course, um, you know, so many of you have um, worked so hard to uh, develop telehealth, to develop uh, programming and services to meet the uh, increased needs. And uh, what I'm gonna be sharing is the data that we've obtained over this period of time um, and how it dovetail, dovetails what we already know um, and what it points to in terms of what we need to focus on next. All right, so what do we know about mental health among young adults in pre-pandemic times? Um, some of my work, as well as countless others, have looked at just prevalence rates of mental health concerns, uh, diagnoses, um, self-harm and suicidality um, in college students. And um, much of this work really demonstrates and highlights the mental health crisis that face uh, college students and young adults. Um, in a data set that uh, I had analyzed from uh, 20, 2015 on about 67,000 undergraduates, what we found is that by the time they are doing the survey in college, one out of five of those students um, have co contemplated suicide sometime in their life. 
And we also know that there are different subgroups that are more vulnerable as well. And so what we see here is extremely high rates of self-injury, suicidality, um, diagnoses among bisexual students, by uh, transgender students. And furthermore, racial mi ethnic minority students were less likely to report mental health diagnoses relative to whites. However, we also see sort of these mixed findings where, um, for instance, Asians have higher rates of suicidality despite these lower mental health diagnoses. And if you drill down further, just looking at the past 12 months, what we see is that of those students um, who did the survey during college, one out of 10 of them reported having contemplated suicide just in the past 12 months with about 1% of students having attempted suicide. And so all of this work and these rates really highlight the importance of college mental health and the work that Dr. Pinder Amaker has been um, doing at McLean Hospital, really trying to reach out to students, um, ensuring that they are uh, cared for um, during this particular period in their life. Well, what is so unique about college age youth and young adulthood? What is it about this time that um, makes them perhaps more vulnerable to uh, mental health concerns? Biological vulnerabilities aside, what we do know, thinking from a developmental standpoint, is that there's so many transitions. And I'm sure all of you know a college student or a young adult, whether it's from your own family, your own children, um, you know, other uh, colleagues, um, people that you work with, that this period is one where you are now um, developing a sense of independence. You are literally moving out of your house and moving into a different place where there are strangers. And so there is um, a sense of individualization, um, a sense of freedom perhaps, but also um, finding uh, one's identity, finding meaning in one's life. And of course, the development of relationships that you perhaps never had before, whether it's roommates or with romantic partners. And here you'll see sort of an underlying theme in um, the data that I'll be showing, which is that relationships matter so much. And this is a time in which relationships are quite fraught. Um, and so um, that may be um, a contributor to some of the mental health concerns that we've seen. We also know that life is that linear. And so if you think about your own career trajectory, you know, there are plans for it to be linear, but it's never that way. Um, so for college students and young adults, um, this may be the plan, but the reality is it's never what it is supposed to be like, right? It is messy, it is chaotic. There are so many unexpected twists and turns and that is life. And that unexpected nature is one reason um, why you know, stress may occur, why people may feel really anxious um, and stressed. And you know, for college students, it's a number of things. It's um, not just the relationships, but of course the academic demands that take place, um, the expectations placed on one trying to figure out their life. Um, you know, the rising rates I think are contributed um, due in part to that stress, but also I wanna acknowledge that there's, there's been a growing awareness of mental health and that, in, that has um, played a role in reducing stigma and those um, you know, individuals in, in tending to report um, their mental health concerns, whereas before they may not have been, they may have been more reluctant to disclose. Um, and certainly McLean Hospital has been at the forefront in um, deconstructing stigma. Um, and that, you know, is plays such a pivotal role in um, people actually having these discussions and sharing the fact that they have, um, they need mental health um, uh, help. And so we do see increased rates um, across time um, with college students. This is data from um, my colleague, Sarah Lipson from BU. And so she analyzed data from over a 10 year period. And um, as you can see, there is a rise in the rates of mental health uh, service utilization. Um, and she attributes it to indeed uh, increased prevalence of depression, suicidality, but also the reduction of stigma during this period of time. So that was yesterday, but what about now as we are living in a pandemic and knowing the consequences of the pandemic on mental health? If you recall, there was a day in which we weren't in a pandemic and that it was simply a pandemic potential and that was about a year and a half ago. Um, but since then we've been confronted with um, events that I never expected such as um, you know, 
uh, loading up on toilet paper, um, but also other issues that have had relative importance, um, you know, doing remote work, having a virtual um, grand rounds. These are all things that have been, um, what, you know, have been new, but now we've sort of settled into this uh, new normal. When, when the pandemic started, one of the groups that were affected first were college students. They were the ones that had to be um, relocated, um, displaced. And some of the headlines um, suggest that, uh, you know, that this was actually a very um, sudden thing to have to do to move off of campus. Um, and we also know um, for a number of us that that move itself was something that um, would be a concern for a particular set of students, those who may already be um, vulnerable to begin with, whether they're first generation students or international students or low income students. And um, I teamed up with uh, Dr. Pinder Amaker, as well as some other colleagues from BU and MGH to really highlight some of the issues that we felt like were going to be pressing when considering and protecting uh, college student mental health. Um, and as uh, Stephanie had highlighted in our work, um, there by the time in which uh, we had put this paper out, which was um, um, midsummer, um, just a few months after the pandemic had hit, um, workshops were being um, converted into a virtual platform to address um, students of color, low income and first generation students. Um, and that also the college mental health program had also begun collaborating with other organizations to really address the needs for international students. And so these are all efforts that really took place within the first three or four months. Um, you know, at the same time in which uh, telehealth was being converted, we also wanted to attend to the needs of students who we felt like would be neglected. And much of the attention on college or young adult mental health wasn't really um, highlighted until later in that summer or in the fall, where you know, there was a focus on um, the virus and the direct effects of the virus, but all of us knew about the mental health concerns. And this was really finally picked up later on that summer. Um, and what we see here is that the data was showing that uh, young adults were having um, a harder time dealing with the pandemic. And there's actually data, good data to show this. And so this is data from the Household Pulse um, data um, drawing from the US Census. And um, I've put together here um, some of the uh, data from uh, April to December of 2020. And I've um, flagged some pivotal events during this period of time. And on that red line, what you see is the rate of depression, uh, depressive symptoms um, for the general population. But if you look at the uh, line graph um, below, the red line there represents young adults, those between the ages of 18 to 29. And you see that they are much higher than the rest of the other age groups. Now, young adults have always had higher um, mental health rates compared to other groups. Um, so in some respects, that may not be a surprise, but I highlight this here uh, to demonstrate that that it still is occurring and maintaining during the pandemic. And you'll also see this rise among um, that red line um, on the bottom uh, line graph, that it, it increases um, during the summer period, um, you know, around the time in which there was some social unrest. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, um, given the data that we did obtain around, um, involving social unrest. But the anxiety symptoms also mimic the depression symptoms. In fact, anxiety was higher relative to depression. We saw rates that hovered um, almost close to 50% among the young adults. So really high rates of anxiety um, in 2020. And so we recognized um, college students moving off campus, the mental health consequences of that pretty early on. And we actually got um, NSF funding in April of 2020. So about a month after the pandemic hit to be able to assess mental health concerns and other psychological experiences for um, individuals between the ages of 18 to 30. And um, to date, we've, we've collected data about 1400 students and we're following them over time. We're currently putting together wave four data. Um, but just to give you a glimpse of who we got, we got about two thirds, um, you know, two thirds of our sample were college students. And then we also had um, majority white, but also um, a fair number of uh, non-white uh, young adults who took part in our survey. Back then we 
didn't have any measures to assess COVID-19 stress and experiences. And so we assembled some items that we felt like were salient during that period of time, as well as adapted existing measures to tap constructs that we felt were uh, pertinent as well, including COVID-19 related grief, as well as COVID-19 related worry. And what we found was substantial levels of grief and substantial levels of worry among young adults. And their qualitative responses in our survey really helped to reinforce the situations that they were facing during that time. Grief related to um, things taken away from them. For instance, um, this individual states, I was really holding on and looking forward to a real graduation, um, but it's another thing that's taken away from me unfairly. Um, another mentioned stress on um, their romantic relationship due to the economic downturn loss of pleasurable activities and social distancing guidelines. My partner and I worked to get married in August and have now called off the wedding for reasons I believe to be related to this period of coronavirus. And finally, worry about family. I find that the largest source of my worry is related to the health and safety of my family members rather than my own well-being. We, of course, um, wanted to assess loneliness, something that was prevalent um, in the general population. And what we found was that indeed levels of loneliness were high among young adults. Now they were, they've been high even before the pandemic, but this, these were the rates that we saw in our data. Um, and uh, we had individuals who did comment on this uh, experience of isolation, but also feeling stressed about being at home with roommates that they did not get along with. We assess social support. And again, I mentioned relationships being so key to understanding the experiences of young adults. And what we found was that when we looked at their levels of reported social support by family, friends, and significant other, we find that the large majority of them do um, report having social support. We do see lower levels of social support when considering um, family. Um, and while it's the majority, about 62 or 63% report having family support, social support, I want to note that almost 40% indicated not having or having low family social support, something that, um, you know, uh, is interesting and something to consider when it comes to young adults and um, their family of origin and the relationships about, um, revolving around that. And as you can see, they do mention relationships with family members, that they're much more fragile since the pandemic began, um, that uh, they may be living with um, unemployed or depressed family members, um, and that perhaps they may be competing with their family members about who has had the worst luck. Um, they may also be reporting uh, stress related to romantic relationships, similar to the last uh, quote that I had shared. And then one individual mentioned um, concern about losing ground in terms of social capital that they worked hard to develop. And as you can think about the college students who moved to campus and developing those relationships, many of them had to just leave suddenly. So with these experiences, did they in any way relate to um, depression, generalized anxiety, or PTSD? And the answer is yes. Um, loneliness, worrying about COVID, um, these were all related to uh, their mental health levels. We also see individual um, characteristics such as resilience and the ability to de uh, tolerate distress. That too also played a role in lowering um, the likelihood of um, having depression or um, anxiety. And then I just wanted to note that family social support mattered um, more so. In fact, it was significant, whereas we didn't see an association with partner or peer social support, meaning that family is significant, um, may play a significant role in one's mental health during this period of time. And one, one interpretation that we had is that for so many young adults, all of them are in the same boat of needing to move back home, of needing to sort of figure out their situations, and that perhaps um, what they could rely on the most were family members because many of their peers were going through the same thing. Um, we don't have definitive uh, data on that, but that's just one uh, interpretation that we had. So what about young adults with pre-existing mental health concerns? Many of you work with these young adults. What is it that they experienced during this period of time? Did they fare worse? And if so, how much worse? Did they fare better? Were certain subgroups um, doing better? 
What we find is that among those with a diagnosis, either treated or not treated, and even those with a suspected diagnosis, we're more likely to score above the threshold for depression, anxiety, and PTSD. Um, and this is perhaps is no surprise to many of you, um, but the extent of it was quite um, striking. So for those with a diagnosis, they were six to uh, around uh, four to six times more likely to um, um, exceed the clinical threshold for um, depression, anxiety, and PTSD. And that also those with su suspected uh, diagnosis fared worse. They also reported um, having more sleep problems and having more physical health problems, and within the context of the pandemic, tended to worry more about COVID-related issues as well as experiencing grief. And the qualitative data supports this. Um, we had individuals who shared about difficulties um, as somebody with depression, that their ADHD and their anxiety um, got worse. Um, and that they had a decrease in um, emotional stability um, and that they lost weight due to food instability and to also stress. And then we had one individual who mentioned having their first panic attack during the quarantine. As I mentioned, um, we were particularly intrigued by the experiences of college students, which really led us to applying for the NSF grant. We also had uh, uh, undergraduate students in our lab, uh, Northeastern co-op students, um, including those who are international students, wondering where they were going to go. Um, at the time in which um, uh, Northeastern had um, requested that students move out, you know, Harvard had already had their students um, move off campus. And so there was a lot of discussion about what would Northeastern do. Um, but all in all, we were wondering, so what do you do and how does this affect um, your mental health and your ability to cope? Um, we looked at the data and we had seen that there were students who had uh, their belongings left at school. They were on spring break. They were out of the country and they didn't really know what to do with their things or where to actually go. So there were a lot of logistical issues that were taking place um, during this period of time. So we looked at the quantitative data to see whether or not those experiences of moving from campus actually mattered for their mental health. And so we looked at um, and focused on a particular question. Were you mandated to vacate from your residence by your university due to the outbreak? And did you have to find new living um, arrangements? And we compared those individuals who said yes to those individuals who did not have to move. And what we found was this, that those who had to move off campus were more likely to experience COVID-related grief, more loneliness, um, and um, let's see here. Let's see if I can move my, uh, yeah, there we go. And also generalized anxiety. So moving off campus actually um, posed a risk for these outcomes. And I should mention too that we controlled for when they did the survey. So they could have done the survey between um, April to August. We controlled for when they did it. Um, we also controlled um, the trans for the transmission rates of um, COVID at their school. So just to ensure that um, that uh, their mental health was not necessarily driven by um, the situation with COVID at their school, but really related to the relocation itself. So with this, we asked whether or not among those who had to move, whether or not um, if they had to leave their personal belongings behind, if that actually mattered in terms of their mental health. So if you had to move your things, or if you had to leave your things behind, did that um, seem to matter with respect to these outcomes? And what we find is that, um, yes, um, if you had to move your belongings, or if you had to leave your belongings behind, um, you are more likely to experience COVID-19 related worries, COVID-19 related grief, and also depression, generalized anxiety, and PTSD. So what does this mean? Um, our data suggests that there may be lasting effects on the psychological functioning of students due to campus relocation or displacement. Um, we have longitudinal data now, so we can actually see um, to what extent these lasting effects last. Um, but what we do know from the initial data is that um, they seem to be associated, the relocation seems to be associated with mental health among college students. 
um, really underscoring relocation or displacement as a major stressor. And we, we all know this. In fact, even the animal literature suggests this, that if you move a rhesus monkey from one cage to another, they exhibit a stress response. Um, that is actually um, something that you can detect biologically. And so um, there's really good um, robust evidence for this, but we are seeing this during this pandemic. Um, I also note that the loss of valuable or tangible objects may also lead to a greater sense of vulnerability. Hence the increased um, risk for some of those outcomes that um, I just showed. And so something about leaving your things behind really do matter um, when it comes to college mental health experiences. I've been talking about the pandemic and experiences related to the pandemic, but I also wanna actually touch upon the social climate, which coincided during the pandemic. Um, last year, we saw a number of protests all over the country and all over the world. And that was really the topic of discussion on social media, in the news, um, and something that we simply could not avoid. It was something that was um, experienced by everyone. And so a question that we had was, you know, there's a pandemic, but what about the social climate? Did that matter for mental health? So this is unpublished data. We have it currently under review where we looked at experiences related to COVID such as feeling lonely, um, also feeling like you're vulnerable to getting COVID. So the risk of getting COVID as well as financial stress, um, which is something that we knew that college students and young adults were facing. So these were prevalent issues taking place during the pandemic, but also social climate that was non-pandemic related. Did these um, experiences seem to uh, confer a risk for depression or anxiety. And what we found was that um, loneliness was associated with depression, um, as well as um, financial stress was associated with depression. But um, COVID-related risk, which is concerned about getting COVID, was associated with anxiety, and social climate mattered um, a great deal as well. In fact, um, if you reported being concerned about the social climate, um, that you are 54% more likely to experience generalized anxiety symptoms. And so this is some initial preliminary data that suggests that we actually may not, we should not overlook these other experiences that are happening during the pandemic, especially in relation to young adults. I mentioned the social climate as well as other, you know, other related concerns, um, including discrimination among um, Asian Americans. Um, this is an uh, area of topic that is, um, you know, something I'm interested in um, being Asian American myself, but also understanding um, um, how Asian Americans are often underrepresented in mental health research. And so my colleague um, from BU um, and I took a look at the data. We actually asked a lot of questions about Asian, anti-Asian discrimination. And as you can see on the right, we um, uh, list out some of the questions that we had, um, whether or not people had experienced hearing about comments related to Chinese or Asian people being the source of the virus, um, you know, being, you know, um, other people avoiding you because you were Asian, um, comments about being dirty, um, whether or not you've been verbally assaulted or um, even physically assaulted. And as you can see here, um, you know, uh, there are no rates of zero. Um, in our sample, we definitely saw um, experiences of discrimination so that um, two thirds of our sample endorsed at least one of these instances. And I can tell you um, firsthand from people around me that um, these experiences of discrimination are really quite common. So the question is, if you experience discrimination, does this have anything to do, does it affect your mental health? So this is cross-sectional data, um, but what we do see is a link between COVID-related discrimination and also PTSD symptoms. Um, and we didn't see an association between depression, uh, for depression and anxiety. But why is it that discrimination experiences among Asians might confer a risk to PTSD? You know, discrimination is an experience where you are uncertain at times um, or certain that somebody is going to hurt you. And so um, if you experience that, you may be more prone to being vigilant about other situations where you might um, be um, assaulted or attacked. 
And so um, it makes sense that the discrimination experiences that are occurring for Asian Americans during this past year are linked with their uh, level of PTSD. So we've talked about various vulnerabilities as well as um, these outcomes related to mental health it makes sense. Um, this is why we're convening is that we're concerned about mental health among young adults. But I also wanted to point out that we're now in 18 or 19 months of the pandemic. And um, is there, you know, upon reflection, are there moments in which while we've experienced hardship that we might be able to ad identify silver linings? And we decided to um, ask this question in our wave two data, which took place last fall. And so we asked the question of our young adults, did you experience post-traumatic growth? And we assessed that using the post-traumatic growth um, inventory, which taps questions such as, did you personally grow from the experience? Have you seen people sort of in a better light? Um, you know, how have you grown from the experience? And um, what we find is that young adults had pretty low levels of uh, PTG. Um, and we, we look at these levels um, um, you know, in response to sort of the um, choice options. And so it was between, I did not experience this change at all, um, or I did experience this change to a very small degree. So the average score was really hovering between those two um, response options, suggesting that there was there has been relatively little um, growth or silver lining um, for young adults. Um, now, this was data that we obtained last fall. We are going to ask this question again in just an, another couple of months once we have our next set of um, surveys um, approved by the IRB. So we'll be able to see whether or not these scores might have increased over the past year. I'll also note that Asian Americans had the lowest uh, PTG scores. And so thinking about the previous slide where I showed about Asian uh, discrimination, to me, that is no surprise, um, but that's also something that we're going to look at more carefully, which is uh, racial and ethnic differences as it relates to post-traumatic growth. We also um, took a look, and this is data that's unpublished currently under review. So while we documented low levels of PTG, we also wanted to see whether or not PTG might moderate effects um, between uh, pandemic related distress and um, depression and anxiety. And what we found was that PTG did not moderate the relationship between pandemic related distress and anxiety, but it did for depression. So what you see here is that for individuals who have, who report high levels of pandemic related distress, if they had um, uh, higher levels of PTG, they were less likely to um, experience or report uh, depress depressive uh, symptoms. And so we can perhaps conclude that PTG, that um, reflection of growing from a difficult or challenging experience or traumatic experience, um, if you have that mentality or if you've come to that conclusion, that that may be protective um, against um, distress related to the pandemic. Um, and I want to say, you know, this is something that we see in young adults, but uh, just this past week, I showed this data to a colleague here at the Brigham who works with a geriatric population. And so um, after showing it to them that night, they looked at their data and they found the same thing. And so this may not be specific to young adults. Um, there's not a lot of research on PTG during the pandemic, but uh, perhaps this is an area of exploration, which is that, you know, if there is a moment in which if there's an opportunity for somebody to be able to say, hey, I've grown from this experience in some way, you know, could that help facilitate um, adaptation, um, you know, um, protect them from uh, later uh, mental health concerns? So some takeaways, um, you know, I mentioned at the very beginning, mental health continues to be a public crisis for young adults. No surprise to this audience. Um, as you can see here, this is a infographic that we have, um, which you can find on my website. Um, but you know, young adults are showing high levels of loneliness, pretty high levels of depression, anxiety, and PTSD. They were high before, they're still high. Um, and they're struggling to cope. So you know, there's not a lot of uh, young adults who are saying they are resilient. And there's also not a lot of young adults who are saying they are able to handle distress. And so for those of us, um, you know, many of you who focus on distress tolerance, 
who are trying to build up resilience, um, these are the rates that we are seeing in our young adults. Um, and so, um, you know, th there are some uh, directions, um, I believe, that we can go in terms of thinking about how to actually support young adults and equipping them with resources and um, a sense of being able to sort of get through this period of time. Um, and as you can see, uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, I would say, despair, quite honestly, with respect to how they're seeing the world right now, as evidenced by some of the quotes here. As I mentioned, I think that there's something to be said about the social climate that we often are missing, especially those of us who study the pandemic and mental health. We cannot neglect what is happening in the US because that is playing a, a pretty big role on young adult mental health. Um, you know, In our qualitative analysis, we are seeing um, a number of topics that are coming up for young adults. It's not just mental health. Um, their thoughts about government and politics, their concerns about education. Um, there's not a lot of conversation about um, or a lot of uh, report about silver linings, though there are some. Um, what they are sharing is that they are concerned about discrimination. Um, they are concerned about the conversations that they are having with family members and others. They're scared to have some of those conversations. And um, many are exhausted, too, with um, feeling like they have to stand up and, um, constant, as this person mentions, having to constantly fight for my right to live. Um, there's also, um, I would say, a silver lining to all this, which is relative to other um, age groups, young adults have been very active um, and involved in social activism. And so the BLM movement is something that um, they've been committed to. And uh, you know, see, these are some of the rates um, in terms of the activities that they're in engaged in. So. 80% have signed an email or a petition to um, try and advocate for, um, for Black Lives Matter. Um, they've, the majority have contacted a public official, participated in a civil rights group, joined a protest. This is the majority of the young adults. And there is this sense, this sense of, have, of needing to stand up um, and to, you know, there's also a sense of being excited for the possibility of change in policy. And so, I personally think this is a silver lining. It's an encouragement to me that in the face of experiencing um, hardship with respect to mental health, that young adults are also feeling like they can stand up and actually involve themselves in the lives of other people to better the lives of other people. And so that to me is a very huge encouragement. As I mentioned, we must consider the experiences of various groups. I'm currently consulting with Stop AAPI Hate, who is now um, recognized um, the importance of racial trauma and the effects of discrimination and these racial inc incidences against Asians, that um, it is having this downstream effect on their mental health. Um, with my colleagues, uh, we've put um, forth commentaries to really advocate for this. And furthermore, we've looked at other groups. Um, I have a wonderful uh, med, uh, med student who came to me wanting to study um, sexual and gender minority students through the CARES data set. And uh, they worked so hard to get a great number of um, individuals to participate in the study. And that resulted in this paper here. And so we are really trying to understand the different experiences um, of our young adults um, to really highlight and help, help advocate for their needs. So as you can see from all my slides that um, you know, they represent me still processing 2020, um, but we are now um, about to enter into 2022. And so what does the next year have in store for us? Um, you know, for me, um, I've been focused on thinking about not just um, the mental health risks and concerns that's important, but also trying to understand the bigger um, bigger experiences, sort of like a higher level experiences of young adults. So why the pandemic? Why uh, social? Um, why social justice? Why are all these things having such a impact on young adults? How are they perceiving these experiences? And so I've been talking with other colleagues about a sense of safety that maybe young adults, even if they've had a wonderful early life, no major early um, um, adversity, they still may not necessarily feel safe um, in this current world. Um, we also have other concerns such as climate change that uh, many are um, advocating. 
um, for you know change in, um, in in that area. And so there's so many different things that are taking place in their lives, and I wonder about their sense of safety. Separately from that is you know what about um, uh, stigma? Are we still experiencing stigma? And I think we are. I think people are still holding to mental health stigma, but I think that we're starting to chip away at that. The pandemic has revealed to so many people um, how mental health is important for everyone. Um, I've talked with countless people who now are so open about their mental health concerns because it's acceptable. The pandemic has really uh, done a number for so many people. And so is this a moment um, within uh, psychiatry or psychology where is this sort of this pivotal moment where we can actually leverage um, this awareness to really now underscore and address stigma in a way that really transforms um, mental health um, um, priorities. Um, so those are a couple of last thoughts that I have. Um, I want to acknowledge so many people um, who have contributed to this work that I've presented here, many um, individuals and trainees from uh, my hospital, um, as well as uh, my colleagues over at BU, and of course, Dr. Um, Pinder Amaker, who's um, been so such a wonderful resource and helpful in thinking about our data. And I um, obviously appreciate the funding that we receive from um, NSF, as well as some other um, philanthropic um, sources. Um, if you'd like more information about my lab, you can uh, find that here. And on the right is our uh, website for the care study, our COVID um, adult resilience experiences study from which I uh, shared uh, today. And the infographics that you saw earlier can also be found on our website too. So with that, thank you so much. Happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu. That was amazing. It's such an impressive body of work. I'm sure others join me in uh, feeling so grateful for the sense of urgency that you had in effectively standing up the CARES project, really at the height of the pandemic. Um, just really phenomenal in helping us to um, track, begin to track the impact of these um, once in a lifetime um, events, almost in real time, the impact of these events on mental health. Thank you. Um, the infographics were wonderful too, appreciate. Um, as we're waiting for questions to come in, um, just wanna say how, which I appreciate um, your attempts to identify a silver lining. I mean, some of these findings are very distressing and, and sobering, um, but your attempts to, through science, hypothesize about and then document what might be some silver linings from mental health perspective. So searching for um, evidence of post-traumatic growth, for example, um, and documenting the rise in student activism um, throughout as a result. So we are taking questions and here is one. I am curious if there is a comparative data, if there are is a comparative, if there are comparative data with young adults, mental health resilience during other fraught times, for example, during Vietnam, perhaps studies didn't exist then, or even more recently, the early post 9-11 times? That is such a great question. Um, yeah, this is a great question. I don't know. I haven't gone there yet, but this is a really wonderful direction for me. I think what I'm reading in this question is the possibility of cohort effects. Mm -hmm. Is it this generation at this period of time? Is it young adulthood? Um, you know, I think looking at that literature can really help us um, um, explain that further. I, I personally think it's both, that it is something about this uh, young adulthood, as well as this particular period of time and this convergence of all that is going on in the world. Um, though that being said, during Vietnam, you know, I know that I, I wasn't there during that time, but 
um, that there, there are similar sentiments. Um, I, I do want to note, though, that the research, young adulthood, or what people often now call emerging adulthood, that as a developmental period for study has not necessarily been the case. It hasn't necessarily been seen as a separate developmental time point. Um, you know, there have been adolescence, but young adult, adulthood now, I mean, it was just considered adulthood. <laughs> and so um, I, I, would, I don't think that, I personally don't expect that there's a ton of data on young adults, um, the way that we've um, thought about them um, as emerging adulthood. But um, yeah, it's such a great question. I, I'm going to look into it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as other questions come in, I have a question. Um, given the documented um, impact of forced relocation on the mental health of college students, what you were able to clearly document in the short term, and I understand that you have longitudinal data that you can are in the process of analyzing, but I wonder what practitioners should be thinking about given what has been documented and the period in which we find ourselves, this period of transition in which students are now returning to school at another time of great uncertainty. Yeah, you know, I've thought about this. I mean, moving around is a pain, quite honestly, <laughs> right? Um, which is why we're also sedentary because it's like hard to get out of our seats. Um, but you know, I, I think, I, I, I don't know. On one hand, I think that we may have gotten to a point in which we've adapted to not knowing what might happen at any given time, right? I mean, I personally am surprised um, by the breakthrough cases that took us by surprise. I think we had one month, June maybe, where things might've felt normal. And then we went back to people getting um, COVID, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, as jarring as that is, I, I, I think we're, we're changing so quickly. I think our bodies are changing, our attitudes and our thoughts and opinions are changing so rapidly, um, such that I wonder if we're also sort of used to that, um, needing to pivot all the time. Mm -hmm. In some ways, it's no different than being vigilant. So I worry about that. Is it adaptation mm -hmm. in a good way? in an optimal way, or is it vigilance because um, we may have to, you know, the students may have to move. And so I think, um, and I apologize for this roundabout way, in fact, really just uh, thinking out loud is that- I love when, when you it, do that, <laughs> when you think out loud, it's just fascinating to watch. So go ahead, don't yeah. apologize. <laughs> Which is, as a clinician, I wonder if that's sort of what you have to detect and, and probe is, is this a healthy adaptation of the new normal or is this individual really um, on guard, on edge? And uh, I'd love to hear more from you and others as to how you might be able to kind of suss that out. Um, because, you know, we know about chronic stress, the more that you're sort of um, uh, adjusting and uh, sort of anticipating and ready to pivot over time that is going to wear, wear on your body. So how do we guard against sort of that chronic vigilance and chronic stress? How can we call that out when we see it? It's so helpful to think about some of these um, potential implications for treatment. You had mentioned one earlier about um, just the value of clinicians um, being very mindful of developing distress tolerance skills in a sort of more proactive way um, with patients. One of the things that I, I was struck by the finding that you reported about students reporting a loss of social capital as yeah. a result of this experience. And in the students that we've continued to work with remotely throughout the pandemic, um, one sort of anecdotal um, report that we're hearing very consistently from students um, increasingly across the months leading up to the return to college is um, the fear of having lost, um, becoming de-skilled socially. Mm -hmm. We've been hearing that over and over, mounting anxiety and concern about students during 
remote um, schooling feeling like they've really lost the ability to interact Mm -hmm. interpersonally in person. And I wonder um, if anything related to that has come up in your findings as well. Um, I have not seen that yet. Um, but we, yeah, I have not seen so much about the adjustment. And that, I think that's due in part to the fact that we didn't put out a wave of data collection since May. The one that we did in May was really focused on mm-hmm. the social climate. Yep. And so um, this is a really excellent question that we can try to um, get at in our wave four data collection coming up this fall, which is adjustment and um, ongoing concerns about relation uh, about social interactions and interpersonal experiences, which, as I mentioned, relationships have been so um, fraught in many ways and confusing that, uh, you know, I, I think that there will be individual differences too. some who mm-hmm. will kind of roll with it. Um, and some who will really struggle with it. I, I do think that there, there may be um, different um, types of individuals. Thank yeah. you. Experience, yeah, experience sort of hardship in that area. Yeah. Another question um, that's come in is, do you think global warming will have a similar impact? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned um, sort of, uh, you know, offhand about uh, uh, climate change. And I, I do think so. I really do. I think it's sort of this pervasive um, issue. Now it's sort it's, it's sort of like coming in on us, right? I think about uh, New York, um, not that long ago had yeah. flooding. And um, I also think too that social media and online news and the, the rapid, um, sort of this ability are not being able to sort of take, you know, tune that out um, because it's, it's really in our face um, for better or for worse, right? Um, that we're just seeing evidence of that in, in our lives. And so um, I think that, and I believe some other, um, some experts have talked about that this, that global warming is actually gonna be a bigger issue than the pandemic itself. Um, I've been keeping my eyes out for this. I do know that there are some professional organizations such as the American Public Health Association that has um, has assembled a work group focused on climate change and mental health. Um, I'm, you know, I'm still really new to that area, but I'm keeping my eyes out just because when I mentioned that experience of safety, um, I I think about climate change, you know, I, pandemic, yes, I think, you know, that's sort of our fir- first sort of pivotal moment where we don't feel safe at any given time around people in the public. Um, but I think that climate change and global warming is another very similar um, experience for many. Yeah, thank you. I think we have time for one additional question. And um, the question is um, from David Steinberger, who wants to know if you collected any data on smartphone social media usage, and if so, were there any interacting effects such as of such usage on the link between COVID-19 related issues and mental health outcomes in this age group? Yeah, we have some data that I have not yet looked at. Um, so we have a few items on the use of social media. What what I can tell you just from the descriptive um, analysis that I did is that, I mean, no surprise, people were on their phones much more. Um, the, 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 the hard thing about, um, I think the pandemic is that we're told to um, connect with other people, but not to be with them, but to physically distance, right? And so the only way to do that really is to do it virtually. Um, but if you're doing it virtually, you're on pretty much the same device for all these other um, um, ways of engaging with uh, social media um, that, you know, and that exposure may not be so helpful, <laughs> right? So it's, yeah. it's it's yeah. hard, right? How you navigate, um, it's, you know, the sort of the risks, but then they're saying, oh, well, that, that's what you need to, you need to be, be healthy and connect with other people. Um, so, uh, so there's some really, I think, 
good directions to go in thinking about how do you tease uh, those exposures apart? What's protective, what's not? Is there sort of a, a good optimal balance for being able to use social media or to use your smartphone? I think personally, I struggle with it, um, but I think there, you know, there's good opportunity to look at data. Thank you so much. Dr. Liu, we are really grateful for the time that you have spent with us today as I sort of reflect on your presentation and how you captured the research and then shared it with us today. You really took this developmental approach and took us on a journey to our where we had been, yeah. um, where we are still all processing um, what we're learning about where we have been and also helping us to think about how we're moving forward and how we might use the data and the science and the findings to mm -hmm. think about our work going forward so that we can provide the most informed um, clinical support to our young adults at this very challenging time, which is ongoing, as you I pointed out, me. it's not over. It's not, it's strange to think about. I think I think of other moments in history and we know like, okay, that world, that world war, you know, lasted this long and these other moments lasted, but we can't, there's, we don't know when it's going to last, you know, yeah. we don't know. Yeah. So it's been hard. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Kamalakar. <laughs>